Hi, uh, my name's Dave. Uh, I'm a Clojure developer from the UK. Uh, in my spare time, I like lisps, writing lisps, and writing lisps in lisps. So if you like any of those things, please come talk to me afterwards. It would uh, be the first time. So today, we're going to take a look at the Y Combinator. Um, we're going to look at what it is, what problem it solves, and hopefully we'll develop some intuition as to how it works underneath. So what is the Y Combinator? A pretty sensible place to start is just looking at the definition of it. It's, it's quite simply a method for achieving unbounded recursion through fixed point combinatorial instantiation of self-applicative lambda abstractions. OK, right, that's a pretty thorough definition, but it's not terribly enlightening. So what do we do when the documentation goes straight over our heads? That's right. We dive blindly into the source code in the hopes that it will all just start making sense. So, with that in mind, let's look at an implementation of the Y Combinator in Clojure. Oof. Okay, so, I mean, even if you write Clojure every day, this is only slightly more readable than the dictionary definition. But I'm sure we've all been here before, right? The, the documentation wasn't very good, and the source code isn't helping all that much. What do we do next? Well, how about we look for some example usages that we can just copy and paste into our own code? That's always helpful. OK, uh, well, this is reasonably understandable. Uh, we have some function f, which is non-recursive. OK, sure. Uh, we pass it to the y combinator, this y function here. right? And that returns a new function g, sure. Uh, and in this case, it seems like g is calculating the factorial of 5. Well, all right. So it sounds like the y combinator lets us create functions which can solve recursive problems. Cool. And that might not seem super impressive until you find out that the Y Combinator works even in environments where you don't have recursion or iteration of any kind. No mapping, no filtering, folding, anything. Not even for loops. So that's what the Y Combinator is for. It's for doing, language, doing recursion in languages that don't have recursion. When does that happen? What languages don't have recursion? Well, uh, maybe you're a mathematician uh, figuring out the lambda calculus. Uh, how often does one do meaningful work in an abstract computational calculus? Well, not every day. Uh, maybe you're writing your own language, and you're trying to do so in a purely functional environment with only immutable values. Uh, okay, so Clearly, the Y Combinator is incredibly useful and applicable in a broad set of circumstances. Definitely worth learning about. Uh, so there's a chance that some of you haven't used Clojure before or don't know it very well. If that's the case, come and see me afterwards, and I'll get you hooked up. Uh, but here's what you need to know in order to follow along. So in Clojure, we can call a function quite simply by wrapping it in parentheses along with its arguments. We can nest these expressions however we like. And these expressions are evaluated inside to out. So in the second example here, the increment 42 is turned into a 43, which is then passed to the second increment function, resulting in 44. Straightforwards. We can define variables uh, with def. Here we can create a variable foo with a value of 42. And then we can use that in any place you'd expect to be use, able to use a variable. And finally, we have anonymous functions. Uh, the syntax for these is pretty straightforward. Uh, we start with a fun, and then a vector of parameters, and then finally, a body expression. And the function will return the result of evaluating that body expression. If we want, we can give functions a name with def. So here we can create a plus 5 function that takes a single argument n and adds 5 to it. And then to call this function, as we said before, we wrap it in parentheses with its arguments. Alternatively, we can forego naming the functions and just use the lambda expressions directly as well. So we can wrap a lambda expression in parentheses with an argument, and that's invoking it. And that's it. So here we are back at the Y Combinator. Well, let's start by taking a look at its structure. We're defining Y to be a function, which takes F, another function, as its argument. Then it calls this lambda expression on this one, and that's it. So let's take a look at that first lambda, which we're going to call the self-application function. This seems pretty straightforward, right? Uh, it's an anonymous function 
it has uh, a single parameter x, and its body calls x, passing x in as an argument. Okay, but what is x? Like, what are the allowable values? What makes sense? Well, we know that x is a function, because we're calling it. Uh, we know it takes a single argument, because it is its own argument. Sure, okay, so we have a function that takes a single argument, and that is a function that takes a single argument, and that is a function that takes a single argument, which is a fu Okay, that's not actually recursion by itself, but this pseudo-self-referential structure should make us think that maybe there'll be some recursion around the corner. So what functions could we actually use here in place of x? Well, we could use identity, that's a classic, but pretty boring. Identity of identity is identity. What if we pass the self-application function to itself? So to do this, uh, we would wrap our self-application function in parentheses along with its argument. And in this case, the argument is itself. So what would that do? What would evaluating this expression actually look like? Demo time. Oof. Right, so here we are with that initial expression. First of all, we're just going to take a copy of it so that we know where we started. Now, this is a function call. Uh, on the left, we have a function. On the right, we have its argument. So we're going to take the argument, and we're just going to shove it to the side for now. We're then going to take that and inject it into the parameter position of the function we're invoking. And that allows us to now just look at the body and expand it out, replacing instances of that variable with the argument that we passed in. And we end up with the exact same thing that we started with. Now, this is another function call, and the rules of Lisp evaluation say that we can't stop. We have to evaluate this one as well. But if we do that, we'll end up in exactly the same situation. We're not allowed to stop. This will keep going forever. So what we have here is a loop. Uh, it does nothing. We can't stop here. But it's still a loop. So from this, two questions naturally arise. One, can it do something? And two, can we stop it? <laughs> so in order to start answering those questions, we're going to jump back to the Y Combinator here. And we're going to look at the second lambda that we've got. Now, this one is a little more complex than we need it to be for now. So we're going to look at a simpler version first, and we'll come back to this one afterwards. So this function is very similar to the previous self-application function, but we have this extra call to f inside there. Uh, we don't need to know what f is right at this point, but just assume it's some function that exists. Now, what happens when we apply this function to itself? What does this expression evaluate to? OK. Uh, same process. We're going to take a copy of where we started. We're going to take the argument to the function call. We're going to pass that into the parameter slot. Then we're going to expand out the body and replace instances of x with the argument that we passed in. And we end up with the same thing we started with, except it's wrapped in this extra call to f. And once again, this is another function call. Lisp says we have to keep evaluating. So we do this again and again and again. And this function is giving us the ability to create an infinite stack of nested calls to some function f. In essence, what we've managed to do is to inject some work into each iteration of our loop. This means our infinitely evaluating expression can now do something. So in order to get our loop to stop, we're going to have to go back to the more complicated version of that f wrapping lambda. So we still haven't discussed what f is yet, but that's OK. We're going to assume it's some function that exists in scope, and we'll pin it down later. What happens if we apply this function to itself? Well, before we go into it, it's going to invoke that function f. And it's going to pass in this lambda expression. This lambda expression is ready to apply x to x, but crucially, at the point that f is invoked, x to x hasn't happened yet. It's encapsulated inside this lambda. So f is going to be past this lambda as an argument, which it can choose to invoke or not. And if it decides to invoke it, based on some condition that exists within f, if it decides to invoke it, it will execute this x of x, and it lets us go one layer deeper into the infinite evaluation loop. And in doing so, it will create another nested call to f, which will be given the same choice. <laughs> 
So each iteration is given the option to go one level deeper if it wants to. Uh, the evaluation of this expression is more complex than the previous two, so we'll look at it with a slightly different kind of visualization. Okay, so here's our initial self-application function. It evaluates to itself constantly, forever, replacing itself, but never changing. Here we have our simpler f-wrapping self-application function, which continuously wraps itself in extra calls to f, growing larger and larger, but never resolving. And finally, we have our more complicated version. Here, f, represented by this blue circle, contains within it some condition c, and also a reference to the lambda that will allow it to go a level deeper. And in this case, it will check its condition. If it's true, it will invoke the lambda, wrapping us in another nested call to f. This next layer will do the same process again and again and again. But eventually, c will return false for some reason. And then we won't invoke the lambda, and instead we'll return a value. And this value will be passed back up the nested stack of f's until all we have left is a value. OK, wow, so we've got everything we need, right? We already had the ability to do something, and now we have the ability to stop doing it. Well, Actually, the last piece of the puzzle is how do we actually express what it is that we want to be done? And that means we need to figure out exactly what f is. So we saw that f contains some conditional statement and also a reference to the lambda that allows it to iterate one level deeper. And with that in mind, we can take a crack at writing one. So here's a function f, which takes that internal lambda as an argument and if some condition is met, it can choose to invoke that lambda. This will perform an iteration of our evaluation loop, which will create another nested call to f, giving it the same choice. Alternatively, if the condition is false, it can just return a value and stop the evaluation loop. Now, this is close, but it's not quite what we want. So to concretize our f function, we'll consider a real-life problem, counting the number of elements in an array, a collection. So in this case, each execution of f represents one step in our recursive solution to this problem. So we'll just start by giving it a better name. We'll call it count step. We know the internal lambda that's passed in is what allows us to recur. So let's rename that too. Now, count step is actually going to want to return a lambda. And this will be the function returned to us by the y combinator. Uh, this function will expect our input collection that we want counted. So we'll add that, wrapping our if statement. We also want to make sure that this input collection, col, is passed on to the next step by passing it into the recur fund each time. Now, we just need to make the condition a function of the input collection so that it can change and eventually stop. And finally, with this framework in place, we can insert the actual logic of how we want to count the collection recursively. So here, our condition checks whether the collection has any elements in it. If it does, we recur with a smaller collection and add one to the result of counting that. In the base case where the collection is empty, we just return a zero. Okay, so with our count step function defined, we're ready to finally do some work. We can invoke the y combinator, which is this function y that we defined here, on our count step function. This will return a new function, which we can call count. And at this point, count contains a reference to the function that creates the next step, as well as the condition for when we should go deeper. And it expects, as an argument, the input collection we're interested in. So the y combinator gives us a function which is ready to turn itself into a dynamically extending stack of nested invocations to count step. When we give this function an input collection, it will pass this argument down the stack, cutting off values one at a time until the collection is empty. That satisfies our base case, our condition returns false, and this iteration will return a zero. The zero is then passed back up the stack to be incremented by each previous step into the final outermost function call returns the number of elements in the original input collection. And that's it. We've successfully counted a collection using only pure non-recursive functions. I think that's pretty cool. So to recap what we've covered here, uh, we talked about the self-application function 
and the surprising complexity that arises from calling it on itself. Uh, we talked about infinite evaluation loops and how we can get them to do work for us. We talked about delaying evaluation using lambda expressions and how that let us break out of our infinite evaluation loop. And we talked about how to write the non-recursive step functions that can solve recursive problems. Well, I, mean, I hope it's been interesting. Uh, <laughs> I've really enjoyed exploring this subject and trying to present it in a way that's approachable. Um, for me, the fact that we can implement recursion in an environment that doesn't have it, an environment hostile to recursion itself, says so something really fundamental about recursion. It's almost as if it's some computational universal truth that always exists, and we just need to shuffle functions around to discover it again. Uh, if you're after some loosely related further reading on the subject, uh, I can recommend these books, each of which cover different aspects of what I've talked about today. Uh, Lisp in Small Pieces, one of my favorites. It's a perfect book for learning how to write your own Lisps, uh, and it has a very detailed section on how the Y Combinator is evaluated in practice. Uh, to Mock a Mockingbird is well, it's a little bit odd. It's mainly logic puzzles, uh, but the second half of the book goes into combinators in surprising depth using a really deep bird metaphor. <laughs> the Little Schema is a delightful book, which takes you through learning scheme, which is another lisp, uh, with a really unique example-based pedagogic structure, which I found really cool. Uh, and SICP is a classic, which among many, many other things, uh, contains useful sections on both the Y Combinator and Lisp language design in general. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we still have two minutes. Uh, do you have any questions that you would like to ask? There you go. Uh, hi, Alistair. Uh, comment on uh, performance and memory utilization? Oh, really poor, really, really poor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So I, I did this, um, I, I came across the Y Combinator, I was writing a Lisp, uh, as you do, and I wanted it to be a purely functional Lisp, and that's pretty straightforward to make, and then I had my Lisp, great. I wanted to prove to myself that it was a real language, and so I, I decided to use it to write a Lisp. Uh, in that Lisp, I no longer had mutation of values, and so I had to use the Y Combinator to enable my functions to recur. And like, yeah, I wrote it, and I wrote factorial of five, and it worked. Factorial of seven, stack overflow. So that's, that's, about, that's about where you're at. You could, I haven't tried six, but it's probably in the middle. Thank you. Um, I see one more hand, or maybe two hands. So, is there a way you could use the fact that your function is tile recursive and do something that would not make it explode so much? The Y Combinator? Um, so, like, the Y Combinator isn't like a practical tool. It's more of a proof uh, that recursion is possible in something like the Lambda Calculus. It shows that theoretically, uh, it lets you explore what can and what cannot be computed. Um, you, real recursion, you want tail call optimizations, you want it to be a lot better, you want it to be a lot faster, you want to be able to shortcut, you want to unroll it into like a, 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 just a list of things to do. Um, but it's still nice to understand conceptually how one could, given infinite computing resources and time. I think we have time for one more question. Are you planning to support uh, recursion in XML? <laughs> I did think about that, uh, but no, that's not, that's not the target of my talk. I like sticking in lists. Although the argument of whether XML is a lisp is a different one, which I won't go into yet. 